So I'd like to start by saying that uh, if you go back in, in time, and uh, you know, depending on your age, you may remember some of this, but you go back definitely to the 50s and the 60s, uh, there was really a feeling that abstraction was peculiar, that it was uh, for the few. Here you see in Norman Rockwell's kind of, I don't know, it's part homage, part caricature, but the connoisseur taking in a Pollock painting. Uh, abstract art seemed really foreign and incomprehensible uh, when it first appeared. And maybe that was part of its appeal, but it put a lot of people off. I have a memory of being at a museum in the 70s when I was just discovering art of a woman dragging her kids away from a mother well and just telling them, get away from that, that's garbage. You know, you may have, you have, may have memories about that. But I think now, fast forwarding to 2022, we find that the whole idea of abstraction is uh, no longer controversial. And it's very integrated in our art in all kinds of forms and, and all kinds of ways. To start with, uh, you know, the way a good teacher should with a kind of a definition, what is abstraction? Uh, a simple way to think of it, it means to separate or withdraw something. A uh, very simple way to put it would be take away what you recognize, and then you're going to have abstraction. So abstract art uh, doesn't depend to be accurate in, in showing us a, a kind of reality, but instead it can be uh, using formal elements. It can use shape or color or even mark making to achieve a kind of abstract effect. I'm gonna give some deep context by saying that uh, actually the, the, the timeline for abstraction in Western art recently changed. It changed a few years ago and I'm gonna be talking about that. But before I get to that, let's say that in Europe, that modernists in, in various nations, in France, Germany, Sweden, and Russia, experimented with pure abstraction or non-objective painting very early in the 20th century. And you're gonna see a variety where some uh, really went all the way to non-objective art, art with no objects, and others had traces of imagery. But the new groundbreaker, uh, the artist that's been talked about ever since the big Guggenheim show a few years ago is Hilma af Klint. Uh, the daughter of a Swedish admiral, who in her own time was really seen as an eccentric. Uh, she was part of a group of women that held seances and took the imagery of their art from visions. Uh, so we, we call her now, we call her a mystic, but definitely her abstract works, and you can see here the scale of the works, which is surprising and kind of awesome. But she did a, a very, very large series of these paintings. She called them Paintings for the Temple. I think there's more than a hundred of them. And these abstract images predate Kandinsky, Malievich, and Mondrian, who have been looked at before as uh, some of the earliest pioneers of abstraction in uh, Western art. And here is a quote from her. So you get a feeling of the way she contextualized her own art. She says, the pictures were painted directly through me without any preliminary drawings and with great force. I had no idea what the paintings were supposed to depict. Nevertheless, I worked swiftly and surely without changing a single brushstroke. And, you know, how remarkable is that? Maybe what we would say now, depending on how we look at Klimt, maybe we'd call it intuitive artwork. But she really had a sense of, of being a medium, of having the art come through her and the abstraction in her work, uh, which often appears in the form of geometric forms or organic forms is something that uh, she did, as you can see here, without changing. You know, very, very direct visionary imagery that uh, founded her abstraction. Talking about some other pioneering uh, artists, I want to point out, you know, when you say modern art, 20th century modern art, it's synonymous with Picasso. And I've, I've had many students talk about the fact that Picasso was an abstract painter. And I want to be clear his own statement was this. He says, I never painted an abstract picture. And uh, looking at this cubist portrait of Kahnweiler, his art dealer, German art dealer, I have to admit that it's highly abstracted to me. Uh, the cubism has, has broken up uh, the form, especially of his body, and made parts of it vanish. So uh, other parts of it, like a shattered prism or a shattered mirror, uh, seem to float in an abstract kind of context. But Picasso did not see himself as an abstract artist. Kandinsky, on the other hand, uh, did make paintings. You can see here in his, his composition number four, 
that had elements that were, I'm going to say, uh, they symbolized, but more than represented, landscape imagery. And in this series of blue rider paintings, you often see a tiny rider on a horse that you can make out. You make out forms that seem to represent roads or trees or hills. There's definitely a rainbow here. So what's the difference between Picasso and, uh, and Kandinsky? You know, which one is more abstract or less abstract? Well, Kandinsky claimed it. You know, he, he was working towards abstraction, saw himself as an abstract painter. Sonia Dulanet um did this painting electric prisms very much i think inspired by technology uh you can see maybe the idea of rotating uh, propellers or fans uh, motion uh, electricity so there was a kind of idea behind her abstraction but she also was a formalist uh working with the full palette kind of the rainbow palette and arranging that in a kind of cubist vernacular <coughs> pardon me don't worry, we're getting to abstract expressionism. We're, get, we're getting there. Malievich was very close to non-objective, although some people might say they see an architecture in his suprematist compositions, but he truly was making an effort to eliminate imagery. He wanted a kind of purity about what he was doing just to get down to a new grammar. Uh, I think you saw, you can see that he saw art in a grammatical way as a kind of a language that was modular and interchangeable. And then maybe the, the purest of all of these early abstract artists had to be uh, Mondrian, who started out as a landscape painter inspired by Van Gogh, and then really reduced and refined, cleaned up his art to the point that it was verticals and horizontals and primary colors. And look at this fantastic statement he made. He really had a definition of beauty that eliminated uh, the figure. He says, by not wishing to say anything human by completely ignoring oneself, the artwork becomes a monument to beauty, transcending the human, and yet human in its depth and generality. And what I get from that statement, it's a little bit paradoxical, it's a little bit, you know, confusing, but it's almost as if, well, you eliminate yourself, and you eliminate the human in your artwork, and then look what happens on the other side, you get a human creation. So that's a little bit of Mondrian's thinking. And of course, we're almost at the United States now. He brought that to the United States as one of a number of very, very influential Europeans who came here and influenced the course of modern art. Uh, when he was in New York City, he apparently really liked to go out dancing. He liked dancing to the Boogie Woogie and uh, the other you know, kind of war tunes. He also gets credit for recognizing Jackson Pollock when he saw Pollock painting in Peggy Guggenheim's gallery, he looked at it a long, long time and then told her, I think that's the most interesting painting I've seen in a long time. One more thing I want to say about Europeans before we get to uh, American art is that surrealism is really one of the footholds, one of, one of the early uh, open doors for abstraction. Surrealist ideas about the unconscious and surrealist experiments with you know, automatic writing, automatic imagery, it really opened up a kind of freedom that made its way into post-war American art. And of course, the presence of European artists who visited or emigrated to the United States in the 30s and the 40s uh, you know, brought surrealism. If you'd asked you know, an American artist before World War II, what is modern art? He or she would probably say, well, Picasso or surrealism. You know, those were the, the dominant things that people were, were interested in as modernity. And think about it. Think about how interesting it was that this uh, European surrealist, Andre Masson, moved to Arizona and uh, made essentially kind of surrealist, semi-abstract paintings with uh, barrel cacti in them and the desert, uh, the desert sand and uh, the hot desert sun with this kind of curlicue uh, yin-yang in the center. And then there was Max Ernst, who came, uh, you know, in the early 1940s, and he was uh, one of his first wife in the United States was Peggy Guggenheim, the art dealer. And she gave this uh, mind bending and influential show in 1942. She had a gallery called Art of the Century, where uh, an architect named Kiesler had designed curved walls. And, you know, these kind of weird television screen shaped screens or, or frames, uh, some of the works were hung by string. 
And this was, you know, the most dazzling avant-garde thing you could see in New York in 1942. And, uh, but she brought, you know, Max Ernst and surrealism into the public eye. And by 1943, he was living in the American desert and uh, did this painting for young people in the United States in 1943. And I don't know what he was painting for young people, except to say it, it has an aura of the ruins and decay of Europe, but presented in a surrealist vernacular. Let's say something about the role of immigrant artists. Uh, we're, we always talk about abstract expressionism as the first great American style. And okay, we can, we can live with that. But think about the incredible presence and influence of Europeans, both in, in, in building that style and, and painting in that style. So Arshil Gorky uh, came through Ellis Island, um, uh, you know, losing his mother uh, in the Armenian uh well, really starving. His mother starved after the Armenian genocide. And he was so embarrassed about being an Armenian uh, that his first wife didn't know he was Armenian until after they divorced. He had, he had an Armenian name. He took the name Arshil Gorky to kind of present himself as a relative of the Russian writer. He, he posed as a, uh, as a Russian. Willem de Kooning, I think, is America's most famous illegal immigrant. He was a stowaway on a ship from Rotterdam who came with commercial art training. Mark Rothko was born Marcus Rothkowitz, a Russian Jew who uh, remembered, you know, the atrocities of the Cossacks uh, from his young age. Um, Philip Gustin, also Russian. Uh, Philip Goldstein was his original name, uh, came Russia via Canada, and then went to Fairfax High with uh, Jackson Pollock in Los Angeles. And of course, the teachers, the great German teachers, Hans Hoffmann and Joseph Albers, brought abstraction and Bauhaus values to the United States. So Gorky began as an artist obsessed with Cezanne, and he also was obsessed with his memories of his childhood and what had happened. And, and when he came on the ship, he brought this photo of himself and his mother, one of the few things he had from his childhood, and he painted this image obsessively. I think there are two finished versions of this uh, canvas. This one he worked on for over 15 years. And, uh, you know, that brought him up to speed with a, a French style, you know, with the work of Cezanne. But uh, he very soon broke into kind of a, uh, an abstraction that we now call biomorphic abstraction. And that's a way of saying that his forms seem to be gleaned from nature. And he did these paintings at the uh, home of his new American in-laws away from uh, New York City. Oh, hang on. Okay. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot of famous stories about Gorky, but, but one that I kind of like is that at one point he was standing in the field painting and a local kid came over to watch and Gorky was a striking figure, you know, a tall man, you know, painting under a tree in probably in a dark outfit. And the kid asked uh, Gorky, are you painting that tree? And Gorky said, no, I'm painting the spaces between the leaves. And I think you can see it here in this, you know, abstraction. That's what milkweed actually looks like. And I don't know that I actually see milkweed in any literal way in that painting, but I see the force of, of nature. I see growth and, and energy. The plow on the song was uh, taken from memories he had of growing up in the beautiful countryside of, uh, of Armenia. And uh, you can see that uh, his use of line was spectacular. He was uh, a very, very well-trained artist who could render uh, you know, realistically when, when needed, but he brought that kind of tension and precision to his abstraction. Okay. So a good question might be, why did abstraction begin to develop in post-war, you know, especially in the United States? And we've started to answer that, talking about surrealism. But there are some more things to mention. Robert Hughes really promotes this idea that the newsreels people saw during World War II were, of course, in incomprehensible, uh, the images of the Holocaust and, and, and more. Uh, people were so, um, you, you fill in the word, upset. Uh, blown away, uh, incomprehending at the violence and the death they saw. It was almost as if, uh, you know, newsreels and, and war footage 
outdid anything the surrealist could create in strangeness or in violence. Also, I think the, the feeling of a new era, we all came into the, uh, you know, the 1940s in a new era of atomic power and uh, the images of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the idea of that kind of possibility of apocalypse, it changed the way people thought about the imagery of art. On an intellectual note, abstract art let artists and critics have new kinds of speculations. And uh, so that was very, very important. Criticism drove a lot of the interest and the support for abstract expressionism. And as I mentioned, an outgrowth of surrealism. But then I think the last bullet point really is, is important. It was new. And after World War II, again, after the devastation and the difficulty, new had a tremendous appeal. So here's a, the media played a big part in the presentation of abstract expressionism, American abstraction. And this is a famous uh, news photo that ran in Life magazine in 1951. And of course, Pollock is there, Mark Rothko is there, Robert Motherwell is there, de Kooning is there. Trivia question later, I'll let you do it in chat if you can identify the only woman in the photo. Put that in chat, we'll see if anybody knows. No Google, you just have to see if you can, if you can do that. But um, you can see it was this, uh, you know, very serious undertaking of in this one photo, well-dressed men. Uh, they actually were here because they were complaining of being shut out of a 1950 exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum. And now let's 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 zero in on Pollock. Let's talk about Pollock and talk about why he was such an important, such a seminal figure. And here we see him with uh, his wife and partner, uh, Lee Krasner. Pollock was someone that early in his career as a student, you wouldn't have seen as a genius. You know, you would have seen him as a troubled young man, which which he was. He was an alcoholic uh, from his teen years given to binging and to uh, violence. Uh, two of his brothers were artists going to school in New York, and I think they were the more sensible ones and the ones that did better in school. He was a, uh, you know, kind of just a violent, driven young man. And he went into Jungian therapy in the 1940s. It was, it was one of the many attempts that various people made to cure him of his alcoholism. And the therapy had an unexpected byproduct it got him interested in Jungian imagery, in uh, the unconscious and symbols, kind of took him into surrealism. So this painting from 1943, the stenographic figure, has this kind of scribbling and writing that goes all across it. Otherwise, you might call it you know, Picasso-like. And this all-over tendency, this feeling that a canvas had no beginning and no end and, and no edges, was something that was distinctly Pollock that began to be a feature of his artwork. I also want to say something about action painting, which is one of the varieties of abstract expressionist painting. Uh, it actually began to appear in 1936. Harold Rosenberg, a notable critic, was the first person to use the phrase action painting. And it even could apply to some painting that had happened in Europe. For example, Joan Miro had drips in some of his paintings of the 1930s. But to define it, Action painting is a very direct and instinctual way of painting. It's a dynamic way of painting. And if you have vigorous sweeping brushstrokes and chance effects, maybe including a dripping or spilling, then you're an action painter. And I love to tell to people the story that this idea of action painting was so ingrained in American art and even American art education that a friend of mine who went to UC Riverside in the 1970s remembers having a critique in his class where the instructor took everybody's paintings and he said, let's talk about whether you have good drips or bad drips in your painting. And of course, what's, what's a good drip? What's a bad drip? They had an argument about that. But I guess the idea was that if it was spontaneous, if you didn't plan it, that was a good drip. Spontaneity was a value of, of action painting. So Pollock made his way after the war, he, even though he was a very established artist, he showed in Paris in, in 1944, but he made his way towards this kind of drip technique. He began to section his canvases. He began to work on the floor. He looked at Indian sand painting. And by the time he reached this painting, Full Fathom Fine in, in 1947, you can see he was completely into the painting in a new way. 
And I love to look at the list of the, the medium for this particular canvas because oil on canvas, and by the way, oil on canvas was probably auto enamel was what Pollock tended to use with sticks and, and brushes. But in addition to that, nails, tacks, buttons, a key, coins, cigarettes, and matches. And a friend of mine who is in the restoration business says that about 30 years ago, he was involved in restoring a Pollock that had a Marlboro cigarette on it that was falling apart, you know, decaying. And they made the decision to smoke another Marlboro down as far as, you know, Pollock had smoked it. And then they glued it on the canvas and replaced the one that had, you know, fallen off because they felt it was really important to have the cigarette in the painting. And there's a close-up of Full Fathom 5. So you see this one has some, some brushwork as well as some dripping. Pollock, uh, you know, was, of course, became a media figure pretty quickly, uh, was on the defensive. Uh, you know, Life magazine called him Jack the Dripper, which was, you know, both a compliment but an insult at the same time. So he did what he, he, did what he could to defend his approach to painting. And in this particular quote, he says, my method of painting is a natural growth out of a need. I just want to express my feelings rather than illustrate something. Technique is just a means of arriving at a statement. And for a man who was known to be quiet and inarticulate, that's a very articulate statement. You know, he's expressing feelings, not showing you something. And he also argued that he could control what he was doing because one of the common, you know, criticisms was, well, he's, he's out of control. You know, the man doesn't manage his paintings at all. It's just, you know, it's lasagna. It's, uh, you know, it's just random. So there is a very, very famous film of Pollock by Hans Namath that shows him painting, both on uh, a sheet of glass and on some canvases. I'm going to show you one of the many edited versions of that film that's on YouTube. And they took away the original super modern music and gave us some classical music. I'm not sure if that fits for Pollock, but let's take a couple minutes and watch this and get a feeling for what his working method was like and, and what it looked like. And by the way, if you don't get sound with this, it's okay. <laughs> on from that but uh you know if that looks striking to you right now imagine how that looked in the early 1950s just a completely different way of painting and a different idea of what painting should do uh you can see it's like a kind of performance he's, he's absolutely in the painting and the painting is done in a kind of a uh trance or a walk around where he went every way around the edges of his uh, panel or his canvas and uh had to decide when it was finished there's another Pollock quote I really like, um, and I, I, I don't know if I'm going to get it exactly right, but Pollock said, I don't imitate nature, I am nature. And to me, that's a kind of, uh, that sounds like Asian art, you know, the idea that there is a, an energy in things that as a painter, you are uh, tapping into. So paintings like this one, his large autumn rhythm of uh, 1950, 
established a whole new aesthetic and, and mesmerized a generation of young artists. Uh, the scale of Pollock paintings was often very, very large. And in this one, which is in Australia, uh, Blue Poles of 1952, uh, he did a complete drip painting and then felt that it needed something rhythmic. It needed something to give it unity. So he put paint on two by fours and laid the two by fours down to give the, the blue poles that make their way um, across the canvas. I like to point out as I go through this lecture that uh, there's a lot of abstract art that has some aspect of figuration and even Pollock in some of his late paintings in 53 and 54 put representational, put recognizable images like this self-portrait into drip paintings, which gives it a kind of a, uh, I'm gonna say kind of a psychological narrative. So a wonderful discussion to have with your friends, to have with other painters, to have with your family, over, or maybe over the Christmas dinner table. You ask people, do you like the work of Jackson Pollock? Have you seen a Pollock in person? That discussion will go on for hours. But I think what I would like to do is just say that something we can be objective about is, you know, like or dislike Pollock's work. His example, his example of what an artist could be and how an artist could work was hugely influential all across the world. And Life Magazine helped by asking this question, is he the greatest living painter in the United States and giving him a full spread where he looks more like a garage mechanic you know, than, than Picasso, where, you know, where's the beret? Where's the Eiffel Tower? He was a new image of, of American art. Also, his early death, his tragic death in, in 1956 in an auto accident that added to his mystique and uh, led to a boom in his prices. During his lifetime, I think the most money he ever made was a little over $3,000, which if you transpose that to now, it'd be, you know, Forty or fifty thousand dollars. He he did not earn a lot of money during his lifetime. <coughs> de Kooning, to me, is another prime and seminal abstract expressionist, and here he is with uh, his wife, the artist Elaine de Kooning, in 1952. And de Kooning, there's something about de Kooning which, to me, uh, really has a pop art attitude. There is imagery that makes his way into his artwork that I came, think came from magazines and from media in a way that we don't usually imagine. For example, this is a painting he made. It's now in the Chicago Art Institute, but it's called Excavation in 1950. And when you look at it, I think the first impression that a lot of people have is that it must be a mass grave. It, it must have to do with the Holocaust or World War II because there are so many I don't know, butts and arms and, and teeth and eyeballs and all of it, you know, crashing onto each other. And that would gives it a kind of a, you know, seriousness if you see the painting that way. But when de Kooning was interviewed, he actually said, oh no, my idea from this painting came from the Italian film, Bitter Rice, which you can see featured a lot of really great looking starlets harvesting rice and a rice paddy. He said, that's the imagery of excavation. He said, that's where I got the idea from the, the reflections on the water and from their bodies of everything, you know, breaking up and being reconfigured. And uh, women really were his main subject matter for many, many years. It's worth noting that he was one of the few abstract expressionists who really had academic training and who really could render in a kind of a classical way. You see it here in this pencil portrait of uh, of Elaine. But the paintings he built his reputation on were almost a catalog of every possible thing you could do to violate the surface of a painting. Uh, Woman One, it was one of a series of paintings that he worked on for a number of years. And I'm not sure I have this story entirely right, but I think this is a painting that he left out in the hallway. And a friend of his actually sort of took off with it and began walking down the streets of New York to take it to MoMA. I don't know if that happened, but a friend had to take it away from him to just say, you need to, you need to stop working on that painting. When you go up close, you know, there's this impression of, of speed, brush strokes, chaos going every which direction. He really energized every one of his uh, surfaces so that you feel uh, the emotion, you know, Jackson Pollock style of the making of the painting, the dynamism, the energy, even the aggression that went into these images. And yet, 
the source, like I say, is, is rather is rather pop. I think there was a lot of Marilyn Monroe. I think there were a lot of poster girls, you know, in in de Kooning's art that he was in some way, you know, coping with, you know, doing something their image that made him feel like he was owning the subject matter. He also certainly made uh, landscape images like this fantastic door to the river in the Whitney and everything he did it's as if he found that kind of tension between the classical ability that he had brought from Holland and this new painterly expressive way of painting of let emo letting emotion and spontaneity dominate his uh, decisions as an artist and of course there was a practical side too which I, I think is really really interesting just the way he painted uh, made a big difference his paint was often mixed in salad bowls uh, his brushes uh, often had very, very long handles. He'd been a sign painter, I think, in maybe the 30s and the 40s, and he used sign painting brushes with, you know, several inch long bristles that you could whip around. He also added mayonnaise, safflower oil, and other oils to make his paint slippery. And I learned this in college. We actually had a teacher that encouraged us to put mayonnaise in our paint one day and paint with it to paint like de Kooning. And it was a, it was a slip and slide. You know, the paint was going all over the place. It was very interesting. He also sometimes applied newspaper to the surface of paintings because he'd taught, he'd been learned as a student, you took off the excess oil that way, but he used it as a way of maybe destroying what he had done the day before of, of smushing it up under the paper and coming up with something different. But there's a, uh, you know, a later, maybe from the seventies, a, a picture of de Kooning with all those salad bowls and hundreds of dollars worth of oil paint, just ready to go in all its uh, lusciousness. So American art was a dominant style. It was a period style. Abstract expressionism kind of covered the world. Pollock uh, was hailed as a truly American artist. And he certainly looked the part, maybe even played the part to a degree. New York uh, seemed to overtake Paris as the capital of the art world. Although I'll be telling you in a little bit, there were some amazing artists in Paris as well, even though Paris was recovering from the German occupation. We've learned now that the CIA actually supported international exhibitions of abstract expressionism because, uh, you know, the comparison was, well, in the Soviet Union, they use imagery for propaganda. Here in America, we don't have propaganda. We have freedom. Abstract expressionism represented creative freedom. It was something distinctly American. And of course, the fact that the United States dominated the world militarily, economically, and now culturally was all of a piece in the post-war period. And one of my teachers I had in college remembered this because he was painting the 1950s. Everybody talked about it. But a show that de Kooning had in 1956 grossed a million dollars. And uh, nobody had seen money like that. And the gold rush was on. I mean, de Kooning, when he, when he came to the United States, he sold, he sold shirts to stockbrokers from a, from a shopping cart on Wall Street. So that's how far he came. He was the guy that grossed a million dollars in 1956. And again, is that 10 million now? I, I don't know what it would know, be, but the art market was transformed along with the sensibility. So some more of the abstract expressionist artists, Franz Klein, like uh, Gorky, began uh, painting rather like Cezanne, but then discovered that he could make these kind of architectural calligraphic uh, paintings. He claimed that he was not influenced by Asian art, but I'm not sure that's true because many of them have a very calligraphic aspect and he rarely used color. He apparently had, he had one show where he had some color in the paintings and his mother came and told him that he couldn't use color well. And then he went back to, uh, to black and white. Philip Guston, I think a lot of you know him maybe better now for his uh, very blunt representational paintings but he was a leading uh, you know, abstract expressionist painter. Uh, some people have called these paintings that he did abstract impressionism because they have a little bit of a feeling of Monet's pond, but with a different uh, palette, these kind of woven shaggy crisscrossy brushstrokes. Grace Hardigan, as, and we'll talk about her kind of at the end of today's talk, actually had a very, very uh, good start in the early 1950s, had a big reputation as a painter, painted both representationally and abstractly. And I look at this painting here called Rither Bavers, and I see a kind of an in-between 
where you know if you, if you have abstraction and representation as a one to ten scale, I think she's at a five. She's right in between the two approaches. Robert Motherwell was a collagist, loved French painting, and had a kind of a uh, how do I say a refined sensibility, a connoisseur sensibility. And his best known series are these elegies to the Spanish Republic, but I think formally deal with the way that you try to look past an abstract painting, you try to look past the black forms into the spaces in between and getting a feeling of being both pushed out and both being let in by the forms. Uh, and then maybe you could see it another way. One, one critic famously looked at these and said, oh yeah, bull testicles. That's another way of looking at uh, Motherwell's elegies. Mark Rothko, I think is like Pollock in that he's another litmus, you know, the way you feel about uh, Rothko is going to determine quite a bit about how you feel about modern art in general. I got to see this fantastic painting 25 years ago uh, when he was in the Bay Area. Rothko actually painted in a kind of a surrealist uh, way. Uh, this painting, Slow Swirl at the Edge of the Sea, was bought by San Francisco Museum of Modern Art very early in the 1940s. And it's interesting to see Rothko as a very tentative, very tender surrealist. But as I'm sure you know, he gradually worked towards this kind of formula, which has been, I think, connected with, with landscape. I think he is a landscape abstractionist, but this feeling of kind of horizons and oceans and skies formed into lozenges. It was the restriction of that format which made Rothko great because he got his painting down to just a few elements to to texture, to edge, to surface, to color. And he began to realize that there was a whole emotional language and also a kind of religiosity, um, you know, about working this way. And as, as a Jew, I think he was the second Jew to be admitted to Yale. He had a kind of a singular and, and set apart vision of how uh, spirituality should be presented. If you have been reading the news, you may read that the Rothko Chapel in Houston just got new skylights. If you've ever been there, if you went there 10 years ago, it was really like a dark movie theater. You, you would go in and everything looked black for a long time, and then you would get a little bit of color. But now if you go in, you're hit with some blues and violets and some grays right away. It's not all, all black. And I just have to say, personally, I went to the Rothko Chapel 20 years ago after a tough year, after a year I'd, I'd had illness. And I put my keys in my wallet into the little bowl they give you at the entrance and, and went and sat down and uh, I cried. It was very, very emotional. And, and I kind of see Rothko as someone that he does what many modern artists do. He wants you to have your own experience with the, with the paintings, whatever the color means to you, whatever the reduction of form means to you. Uh, there's an openness about Rothko that lets you in. He just kind of gets you started, I think, with his... Uh, with his paintings. There was a lot of very, very large painting in early abstract expressionism. And there's a famous quote from Barnett Newman. He once said, you can't go wrong with 26 feet of red. And you know, he did something to be said about that. His paintings just featured these tiny zips as their only imagery. I don't have a photo of one, but I think Ad Reinhardt was another painter who worked with this kind of reductionism and minimalism. Uh, you know, along with uh, with Rothko. Let's take a left turn for a minute, because as I've looked through my old presentation, I thought, what about sculpture? I and mean, that would be a whole lecture in itself. Of course, there was a whole range of development in abstraction in sculpture. So even though this uh, 1941 Calder Mobile has a name, it has the name of Peacock, I'd call it abstract, especially in the way that it, it floats and changes as a breeze would uh, would go through it. David Smith was friendly with the abstract expressionists and was able to use uh, odd bits of metal, tools, cutoffs, drippings from, from his welding shop. He actually worked as a Studebaker welder, was his, uh, was his day job. Anybody remember Studebakers, by the way? But uh, he achieved a wonderful kind of uh, balance between narrative and abstraction. And we have to mention Ruth Asawa, who in the last five years has just gotten such a tremendous uh, reputation 
for her woven baskets. And these go back to 1947. So in the same era, when Pollock was developing his drip abstract paintings, uh, Ruth Asawa was weaving these kind of fantastic abstract baskets. And wouldn't you like to re rewrite art history right now and talk about what do those have in common with each other or what, what do they not have in common? There's a whole book or at least a good essay in that uh, topic. Claire Falkenstein, another artist that, that moved between representation and abstraction, but working with, with wire. All right, I could go on and on, but let's go back from sculpture. Let's, let's go back to painting. Uh, Helen Frankenthaler, after seeing a Pollock show, developed her first stain paintings and a whole new school of painters eventually came out of that with this idea that absorbent grounds and canvases gave you a kind of a bleeding image. It gave you an accident at the edges of things that opened up more spontaneity and more opportunities for the painter to have to respond to what the materials were doing, which is part of, it's an outgrowth of, of action painting. Hans Hoffmann was such an influential teacher, taught so many important painters of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, especially in uh, Provincetown, but also at Berkeley. And he really picked up on the gestural side of abstract expressionism and used it in an original way with both, you know, drips and skitters, but also gestural brushwork and paint itself as a material to be admired. Clifford Still, although he came from the Midwest, I think had his biggest impact in California where he taught at the California School of the Fine Arts and made a whole group of young GIs that were studying there his, his converts. There were a whole large group of men and women who were inspired by Still at the California School of the Fine Arts. And of course, the best known of them uh, is Richard Diebenkorn, who famously went between abstraction, back to representation, and then in the Ocean Park paintings, abstraction again at the end of his uh, career. But from Still, I think he got a lot of his palette and he got this uh, kind of decisively abstract approach. Joan Mitchell was one of a number of artists who worked in Paris. And in Paris, even though, you know, like I say, Paris was still recovering from the war, there were all of the museums and there was Monet in L'Orangerie. And I think looking at what Monet had done in his uh, water lilies, moving towards a kind of horizonless painting. It was very, very important to uh, Joan Mitchell. It was also very, very important to uh, Sam Francis when he made this fantastic, huge Basel mural that's in the Norton Simon now in Los Angeles. This kind of floating perspective uh, did a lot to change the direction of, of abstract painting. Nicholas de Stahl, is another artist who I think is being rediscovered. This one's called the football players. And uh, of course there's, there's an image, you can see a field, you can see figures, but with his palette knife, he scraped it down to the barest suggestions of form, which in itself is an abstract uh, process. Pierre Soulages, if you follow the news, he just died a few months ago. He lived to be over a hundred. So he was the French uh, Wayne Thiebaud by the late 1950s was only using black. And he, he built his career on the reflective qualities of black. And that I think was kind of original that the color itself wasn't the thing, but the way that color would reflect when you reconfigured it was uh, something worth exploring. Coming out of uh, you know the approach that Helen Frankenthaler took, Morris Lewis used gravity to make his great uh, stain paintings, which seemed you know, organic as if there's, you know, the painting is growing out of the canvas in some way. And after uh, Pollock died, Lee Krasner, who had always been a good painter, was able to focus on her own career. And she did some very, very stunning paintings that have a feeling of nature coming through with a kind of specificity that I don't think Pollock had in, in his work. And she was an interesting colorist as well. I want to give you a few recent discoveries because part of the beauty of the art market, it's always churning. It's always looking for people that got left along the wayside. Lynn Drexler is an amazing abstract painter who was uh, married to an abstract painter. She was married to a man named John Hultberg that was a Bay Area painter. But I think people would now agree she's the more interesting artist by far. 
Uh, she was a kind of a recluse who worked on an island off of Maine for many years. And, you know, when she left her estate, people were, were stunned by what she had left. But there's a kind of a garden aesthetic in her artwork that gives you both the feeling of order and chaos brought together with a fantastic sensibility towards uh, color. And another artist who people are taking a look at now is Alice Baber. She was married to Paul Jenkins, who was an artist that worked in Japan quite a bit and also in, in Paris. And she went from being a cover editor of McCall's, uh, art editor of McCall's magazine to being an abstract painter and a feminist who worked with kind of oval and circular and organic forms and developed this uh, you know, fantastic vocabulary of softness that she often worked with her fingers. You can see fingerprints in many of her uh, paintings. A few more to go. Don't worry, we're gonna get to the end of the lecture, but I told you I'd really packed it. Uh, both Zhang Daichen and Zhao Wuqi, who were both born in uh, mainland China, were extraordinary abstract painters who in a way were competing with you know, Americans and, and Europeans. Zhang Daichen's uh, brushed ink paintings, uh, which you see one here where there's kind of an, a landscape image underneath this mineral wash, have sold now for over $50 million. He was the most, he was the best earning artist in the world in 2011. He, he's, he's dead, but his estate was the best earning estate more than Picasso in 2011 as uh, Chinese art collectors discovered his, uh, his work. And Zhao Wuqi, was a Chinese artist who worked in Paris that uh, now is having a tremendous vogue. I think he's one of the best abstract painters ever. Um, had a fantastic feeling of, of maybe nature being inside him, Pollock style, and made these paintings that suggest weather and energy and growth. Look up Zhao Wuqi if you haven't seen his work before. And finally, Gutai, G-U-T-A-I. There was a abstract movement in Japan in the 1950s that was combined with performance. So most of the Gutai works were actually made in public while people watched, so that the making of the art itself was something that felt like a, I don't know, a competition or entertainment and art making all put together. Definitely, as we get toward the 1970s, I don't, I don't think I have anything later than 1972 in this uh, lecture, uh, minimalism, began to uh, I say affect and, and maybe dampen the spirit of action painting. There was a new interest in order. There was a new interest in pattern. There was a new interest in control. Pattern and decoration is another a movement that kind of grew out of abstraction and took it a different direction. And uh, Alma Thomas, another rediscovered artist, an African-American woman who made these fantastic lozenge or mosaic paintings. This one's called A Fantastic Sunset, and you can see her confidence with uh, color. It's almost like uh, you know an aesthetic of a Jasper Johns target, but from a completely different sensibility. And you can't mention 20th century abstraction without mentioning the Aboriginal paintings that have come out of New Zealand and Australia. And this one actually is meant to represent weather over the landscape and all the, uh, the dots, all the dashes, all of the intricate kind of woven strokes give this a very, very dazzling and very original aesthetic. And, and these paintings are now sought after and appreciated. Yep, de Kooning kept going, even to the point when he had uh, dementia and Alzheimer's, um, de Kooning just kept painting, like the rhythms of, of his painting were just always there in him, even as he was more troubled and, and less articulate. All right, Dina said before the presentation, this was like going to college. Let's give it a little more of that college feeling with some afterthoughts, something to wind all of this up. I was thinking as I put this together, we've all heard about abstract expressionism as the American triumph, you know, the great American style. I think it's being reframed. I think there's a now an international perspective you can take on abstraction. That's a great way to look at it. Definitely recent scholarship is telling us a lot about outstanding women painters and the artists that, you know, the roles that they played and where they were in the development. Definitely the feeling that abstraction is, you know, incomprehensible or foreign or strange. I think that's really melted away. I think abstraction, as far as the artists that I'm knowing, everybody is, is doing it. 
it's very significant that abstraction changed the teaching of art. I know that in my generation, most of the painters that I studied with were abstract painters or you know, had been influenced by abstraction. So we sort of lost skilled representation for better and for worse. And now that's coming back. And definitely recent artists have been questioning and exploring the relationship between abstract and representation, re representational painting. And if you know my book, Disrupted Realism, it's kind of about that as well as being about some other things. And uh, okay, for our next Monday, if I didn't wear you out, if you want to do this again, next time we're going to do a pop art on Monday, January the 9th. The second on my calendar says New Year's Day. I figure let's not, you know, let's not do it when we're hung over. So let's go to the ninth, but we will talk about pop art. And finally, I'm going to go to the, I'm going to stop screen for, share for a second because I have some book uh, recommendations for you. Let me see if I can do that. There we go. If I can come on your screen, here's a couple of books for you. If you haven't read it yet, and I know it's immensely popular, so you may have, Ninth Street Women, here's how, how thick it is, will completely change your image of New York City in the 1950s if you have one. It's so well researched and so vivid, but Hardigan, Frankenthaler, uh, Joan Mitchell, Elaine de Kooning, uh, Lee Krasner, it's a, it's a great read. It reads like a novel. And a friend tells me that Netflix has bought the rights. So you want to read it before Netflix, Netflix casts it, you know, and see what they do with it. I also want to have a, uh, a pitch here. One of my sidelines, I'm a, I'm a member of the, the board of the Sam Francis Foundation. So I'm very involved in, in Sam's work. He would have been 100 in uh, next year. So we're going to celebrate his centennial. But we commissioned from Gabrielle Sells this fresh biography of Sam Francis. It's called Light on Fire. It is, oh, what a read. It's, it's uh, you know what, all I'm going to say is it also reads like a novel. It really is a book that you're not going to feel like this is academic or, you know, you're not going to fall asleep. Sam's adventures are, are extraordinary and you're both going to like and dislike him. It's presented in a very, very honest way where there's a few jaw droppers in terms of how he treated people. But there is some very, very moving material about his struggle to become an artist and what he went through. So I recommend Light on Fire and Ninth Street Women. But wait, I'm almost done. I'm almost going to let Martha chime in. I had a student give me this when I was uh, teaching modernism, one of the nicest gifts I ever got. This is the original Life magazine that featured Jackson Pollock. And one of the things that you, you know, let me show this to you. You try to imagine what, what people said about this in, in 1949, but there it is middle of the magazine, a full page spread asking this question, is Jackson Pollock the, the greatest painter? But the part that blows me away is the next page. When you take a look at the next page, you can see, take a look at the ads. One of them is for party platters. And the other one is a kind of, you know, very seductive kind of how to get a man ad over there. Uh, for, uh, you know, or actually, is that for him? Is that shaving cream? That's his shaving cream. How to get a woman. Sorry about that. But you can just see that's that's what a magazine looked like in 1949. You know, cigarette ad on the back and how things have changed and how Jackson Pollock must have stood out, uh, you know, when he was beginning his career. 1057, I'm done. <laughs>